Thanks so much. Good morning, everybody from Hawaii. Uh, my name is Emily Costello. I'm from the University of Hawaii. And today I'll be speaking about passive prospecting for lunar ice using the Iscarian effect with the cosmic ray lunar sounder called corals. And corals is an instrument that we're developing with the support of a selected DALI grant. Uh, this instrument would sense radio signals, which are generated by cosmic ray impacts into the moon. The ultra high energy cosmic rays periodically strike the moon. And when a cosmic ray strikes the regolith, it produces a secondary particle cascade. And here on this slide, we're looking at the first time step of an electromagnetic simulation of the Cherenkov radiation cone made by a cosmic ray impact into regolith. And we can think of this sort of like an electromagnetic version of a sonic boom. This impact and particle cascade produce subsequent strong, coherent, wide bandwidth and 100% linearly polarized radio pulses by a process called the Iscarian effect. And these radio signals then interact with the subsurface, reflecting and scattering like an active by static radar signal. And this physics isn't purely theoretical. The Corals Project PI, Peter Gorham, and our friends in the physics department at the University of Hawaii have been observing the Iscarian effect from cosmic ray impacts into Earth's atmosphere and the Antarctic ice sheet for more than a decade using high altitude balloon instruments. But what we're doing now and what's exciting is applying this technology to the moon specifically for the purpose of prospecting subsurface ice. Um, so we can observe these radio pulses and uh, I've got, uh, on this slide, we're looking at a model, which includes a buried ice layer. That's that white sheet at the bottom underneath the gray sheet of regolith. Um, and uh, I've labeled this bright lobe where we can see the reflected signal off that buried ice sheet. And it's distinct from the impact into dry regolith alone. We can really see the difference in this time series plot where the top three panels are showing a cosmic ray impact simulation and a, a scarian effect pulse, uh, where a continuous layer of ice is buried under six meters of Highlands regolith. And the bottom three panels show the propagation of the pulse in the absence of ice. And you can really see that reflected signal clearly when we're comparing this ice and non-ice case. Now, analysis of these radio pulses, including its spectrum, amplitude, and polarization, will allow for reconstructing the presence and properties of subsurface ice layers in a way that's really similar to active by static radar. Our models have also shown that we could detect layers of dirty ice or ice regolith mixtures. So here I'm showing a plot of the electric field strength as a function of time 25 kilometers away from the lunar surface. So this is an orbital instrument. And I'll note that we can also detect bedrock reflections in the simulation. We've got 12 meters deep bedrock, and that's that little pulse on the right where we can see the, the bedrock reflection. But the really exciting bit is at the center of this plot where we see the reflected pulse. Uh, the reflected signal here um, is from an ice layer buried six meters deep. And these different colors of these pulses represent different simulations of ice regolith mixtures. Uh, and we can see pure ice is that blue line, 75% ice is the, the red line, and 50% ice is the yellow line. And while mixing with regolith does damp the signal, we can still see uh, ice, which is not 100% pure. The day after I had to submit my slides for this, uh, we got new simulations, which included some really interesting simulations of how scattering off of subsurface rocks might affect the signal. And we do see a little bit more scatter than in this, this case, but we are still able to see uh, various levels of ice purity. Um, now, the location and depth of regolith ice mixture is uh, a really important open science problem. And we've been doing our best guess with these simulations to be able to see how well our instrument would, our instrument would be able to observe buried ice. Um, and like zooming out to the science problem, when we think about the moon in the context of the solar system, Mercury has unambiguous near surface ice deposits and radars re uh, resolved that, but the moon doesn't have unambiguous large scale water ice in its PSRs. And compared to Mercury, evidence of lunar ice is much more patchy. It's possible that the moon's PSRs were at some time as icy as Mercury's, 
But thick ejecta blankets might have buried that ice and subsequent smaller scale impacts and impact gardening might have mixed the ice with regolith. So because that ice is buried and because it's stochastically redistributed, to search for mercury-like ice deposits on the moon, these big, large-scale ice deposits, will need to look both widely across a large spatial scale and deeply underneath those ejecta blankets, which are shielding the ice. Now, modeling of crater-forming impact processes and surface evolution can help provide some guidance on how widely and deeply we'll need to search. And in a paper I published in 2021, I constrained the role of impact gardening in controlling the depth to ice in permanent shadow, uh, where impacts are repeatedly uh, excavating and burying material in the regolith. So here are the results of that paper. They're reformatted a bit for this talk, um, but the gray line here and the gray uh, colors are the results of that impact gardening paper. So that impact gardening paper showed that the uppermost five meters have been intensely mixed. They probably don't have any ice layers like mercury did. Now, there might be ice which is pulverized and mixed into the regolith, but it won't be a coherent slab like we're seeing on mercury. And also, not just the gardening saying this, if the PSRs did have mercury-like slabs of ice, <laughs> we would have seen them uh, when we, like we saw mercuries with Earth-based Earth -based radar. Um, however, really thick mercury-like layers might exist at depths below the intensely impact garden zone. So these blue horizons on this plot near the bottom, these represent the depths where Canada et al. 2020 suggested significant ice deposits may have been emplaced and then subsequently buried in Hayworth Crater by ancient impacts. So the instrument that we're developing, corals, which takes advantage of those cosmic ray impacts and uh, radio responses from cosmic ray impacts. This is a uniquely capable instrument of sensing these possible tens to 100 meter deep buried ice layers. Our simulations show that during a two-year mission, uh, we could conclusively prospect the top 20, 20 meters and deeper with longer mission lengths. A longer mission allows for a higher probability that these really high energy cosmic rays will strike a PSR and these higher energies dig deeper and, and produce a signal deeper in the regolith. So being an orbital instrument, corals can remotely and non-destructively prospect for deeply buried ice across both the North and South Poles. And in addition to prospecting for ice, it could detect data on regolith depth across the entire surface of the moon to be able to compare to these PSR observations. Another advantage of this technique over active Radar sounders is that the cosmic ray source acts like an extremely high quality impulsive antenna embedded directly in the lunar subsurface. And therefore we avoid a lot of the decoherence and subsurface, and uh, sorry, and surface losses, uh, which we see with traditional active radar sounding. We also save on swap because we don't need any transmission capability. This is passive prospecting. The natural rain of ultra high energy cosmic ray impacts and the subsequent emission by a scarian effect are the source of our signals. So we need no transmission. In conclusion, the cosmic ray lunar sounder or corals could detect and characterize subsurface ice deposits using the Iscarian effect of ultra high energy cosmic ray impacts. And this represents a unique and viable method to prospect for ice both deeply and widely enough to conclusively confirm or deny the presence of large-scale mercury-like buried ice deposits on the moon. Uh, again, I'm Emily Costello from University of Hawaii. I've put my email here on the screen if you have further questions that we can't address here. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Okay, we have time for questions. Okay, we'll take one from the room and then the next one we'll take one from online. Yeah, that was an excellent talk. I'm, I just was wondering, you, you, you know, cosmic ray is often very destructive. Uh, in addition to making this reflected wave, which is useful, they, sometimes it can damage the ice. So I'm wondering if you have some idea on how much damage to the ice occurs. And then the second question is, what is the minimum amount ice you need. Can you get down to five weight percent or something like that? Yeah, so these are really great questions. I think for the first question, which was uh, 
Sorry, I'm getting distracted by the second question. I want to answer that first, so I will. <laughs> we were able to show in our simulations, we're able to see definitely 50% ice mixtures. Um, as we get more scattering and as it gets deeper, we're not able to see 5% ice mixtures. Okay. Um, and then the other one was destruction. How, how, is, how uh, destructive right. is the cosmic ray? Yeah, that's a great question. So for the ultra high energy cosmic rays, the really high energy ones, which are going to be seeing 100 meters deep and are pretty rare, these produce the signal within the top 10 meters. So even if the ice is 100 meters below, it wouldn't touch that. If it is shallower, there is a possibility that the cosmic ray could damage the ice in some way, but I don't think that's very well constrained yet. For the very deep ice deposits, the ultra high energy cosmic rays, even the highest energy ones, are only going to be making signals at about 10 meters deep. Okay, great. And so, uh, Emily, so one more question from online. Uh, this one's from Brad Jolliffe. How does the sensitivity to H2O ice of corals compare to a neutron spectrometer in the upper meter of regolith? Ooh, this is a good question. So because cosmic rays are in a spectrum, there are both ultra high energy and lower energy cosmic rays. So if we're looking at a shallower scale, like the uppermost meter, uh, we might want to look at the more frequent and lower energy cosmic rays, but to sense them, we might need to have a surface-based instrument. Uh, we are developing instruments and models which explore this more. Um, and the direct comparison to neutron spectroscopy, I don't think we're ready to be able to make that comparison yet, but I can promise that we are developing more capabilities, especially for the shallower scale. So uh, since we're a little bit ahead of schedule, I think we have one more question from the room. Uh, I would like to go ahead and. Thanks, uh, Emily. Hi, Carl Hibbs here. So uh, very interesting, very useful to have a, a new technique for uh, prospecting for water ice, because that is water <laughs> ice prospecting is, is really the uh, major gap for um, water ice utilization of the poles. The question I have then is related to the phenomenology. What What is actually being keyed on here? Are you looking at scattering of the uh, of the particles and can you explain more about how well we can discriminate um, bedrock from water ice lenses and things of that nature right so what makes this great is that we can draw on all of our intuition about GPR and active radar sounding the physics at play is exciting and special because it uses cosmic ray impacts to produce the radar signal but once it's produced, it's very similar, if not exactly the same, as an active bi-static radar signal. So we're looking for dielectric contrasts in the subsurface, ice and bedrock. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, so, so it tells me that it's very difficult then to discriminate water ice lenses from bedrock because the dielectric, dielectric constants are quite similar. Is, is that the case? Well, I have the same trouble then as as radar at those wavelengths, what the wavelengths those are? Yes, it'll it'll behave virtually the same as radar. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. 